Hello, writers, and welcome to another episode of Tea with Tara, Conversations About Writing. Today on the show, we have another very special guest, Rachel Olson, Education Coordinator for the National Willa Cather Center in Red Cloud, Nebraska. Willa Cather happens to be one of my favorite writers of all time, so I'm so excited about today's interview. She wrote, in case you're not familiar with her, she wrote O Pioneer, My Antonia, and my personal favorite, The Professor's House. And today is my birthday, so it's an extra special privilege to be able to talk about Willa Cather on my birthday. So in just a few minutes, we'll be back with Rachel Olson. Stay tuned. Hi, welcome back to Tea with Tara, conversations about writing. And we are now joined by Rachel Olson. Welcome, Ms. Olson. Thank you so much for having me, Tara. It's a oh, pleasure to be pleasure. here. Thank you so much for being here. Willa Cather, I was telling everybody before, she's one of my favorite writers. And just to note, I'm wearing a Willa Cather shirt. Nice. <laughs> that I nice. got from online. Mm -hmm. From our okay. bookstore. Yes. Yep. Okay, so how did, how did you become involved with the Willa Cather Center? Oh gosh, well, it's kind of a long story. So I am not a Red Cloud native, um, but my husband is. And we were living in Norman, Oklahoma, where my husband was working on a, a, his PhD. And I was working as an English teacher at a local community college, um, where I had also been a writing center director. So I have a, an English background. I have a master's degree in English and cultural studies and a bachelor's degree in English. Um, but I was really more of a tw late 20th century literature person and um, sort of a pedagogy and, and writing composition teacher person. Um, but my husband had this email from somebody in Red Cloud and it was the executive director of the Willa Cather Foundation, and they were looking for a heritage tourism and development director. And she was encouraged him to apply, which he did. Um, you know, academia, it, traditional paths to academic jobs, you know, they're, it's really tough and it's been tough for a while. So um, I think we had reached the point where we were, you know, open to new career paths rather than just sort of the traditional teaching and publication path that a lot of academics take. So uh, my husband applied for the job and he got the job. And so in August of 2015, we moved to Red Cloud. Um, we have a nine-year-old daughter. She was not quite three at the time. So we came here and I stayed at home for the first year. Um, but I really, I'm a, I am a person who likes to work. I like to have a job. And so when my daughter started preschool and we had settled in Red Cloud, um, I started giving tours for the Cather Foundation. So I started off just as a tour guide and I ran a pop-up coffee business for a couple of years, just sort of as something fun to do that I'd always wanted to try to do, but you know, I never had an opportunity. And then I decided that I really liked giving tours and was really happy working at the, the foundation at the National Willa Cather Center. And the, the other staff members and, and leaders uh, liked me too. So they promoted me to education specialist. And that was in March of 2019. And then in January of 2020, I was promoted to education coordinator. So my position is fairly new. It's part of a, a fundraising campaign um, that started, gosh, did it start in 2017? Um, called Campaign for the Future. And so one of the main goals of that fundraising campaign was to add to education staff and to enhance educational programs. So that's where my my position came from. And then two months, three months after I started my job, the pandemic started. <laughs> so it's been a very wild ride. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen, right? No. no. So it now, was... had you been a Willa Cather fan? Were you reading her books growing up at all? Well, I wish I could say that I had been, but I wasn't. Um, I should back up though and say that 
you know, the, the setting of the Great Plains and the idea of homesteaders and that kind of hard scrabble life, that very much appealed to me as a child. Um, I was a very big Laura Ingalls Wilder fan growing up. So I think, you know, there was always a path to Willa Cather, but I didn't get on that path right away. Um, I said before, when I was in graduate school, I was really focused on late 20th century fiction, um, particularly Asian American fiction and, um, you know, sort of women writers. So that, that overlaps, but, um, the first Willa Cather novel I ever read, it wasn't My Antonia, it wasn't O Pioneers, it was Safira and the Slave Girl, which is a very odd place to start with Willa Cather, and I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and so I didn't really like that book, or I had problems with it. And so that sort of, you know, I, I didn't read Willa Cather for a long time. Um, but my, when I met my husband, we went through the same master's degree program and his thesis was all about O Pioneers and he, you know, grew up in Red Cloud. So I started to learn a lot more about Cather through him and then working here really sort of sparked my interest in Cather. Yeah, yeah I didn't read her either. The first time I became familiar with her was actually the TV movie, My Antonia with Neil Patrick Harris, mm -hmm. which I believe was in 1995. And then, I, and then I saw the book at a library book sale and said, oh, I mm -hmm. remember watching this movie. I think I'll read the book. Usually you read yeah. the book first, but. <laughs> I remember the movie too. And I probably watched it as a child or as an adolescent. I just don't remember it, but um, no, but it's interesting that I really like her subject matter. And I loved that subject matter in that time period as a child. And I just, you know, never picked her up as an adult reader until much later. So can you tell me a little about Willa Cather and where she was born and how she ended up in Nebraska? Sure. She sort of has a circuitous route as well. Um, Willa Cather was actually born in Bat Creek Valley, Virginia, in Frederick County. And she was born in her grandmother, Rachel Boak's house, which is at, well, actually that's in Gore, Virginia. So she um, was the firstborn child in her family. So her parents were Charles and Mary Virginia Cather, and they lived in a house that had been built by Willa's paternal grandparents, and it was called Willow Shade. And it's a really beautiful house. It's still there. It's privately owned, but it's been taken care of. Excuse me. And um, her father raised sheep and, you know, lived at this house. So uh, when Willa Cather was nine, her parents decided to move to Nebraska. Um, Cather was born in 1873, and that same year, her uncle George and aunt Frances Cather decided to homestead in Nebraska. And so they moved to Webster County. They were the first Cather family members to move to Webster County. And a few years later, I think 1877, uh, Cather's paternal grandparents joined, uh, they moved to Webster County as well and built their own house. So in 1883, Charles decided to bring his family to Nebraska. At that time, there were four children in the Cather family, in Willow Cather's family, and they all moved into the grandparents' homestead which was, I don't know, it's like 13, 14 miles outside of town. And uh, Charles farmed and they did that for about a year and a half. And then we know that Charles auctioned off his farm equipment and he uh, opened a title and insurance office in downtown Red Cloud. And so the building that his office was in is still standing. It's not occupied, the, the office space he had was on the second story and it's not occupied, but it's still there. And they had to find a house in town, which was not easy from what I understand. They really didn't have a lot of options. And so they ended up in this little rental, just sort of a, maybe a block away from Charles' office. And um, it's a little two-story house. It is not big enough for the size of family the Cathers had but they lived in that house for about 20 years. And uh, Willa lived there until 1890 when she went to college. And the rest of the family, I believe they moved, I believe her parents moved 
in 1904, they uh, moved into a much larger house that we also own and operate as a bed and breakfast here in Red Cloud. So, so that was one of my questions actually about her going to college. So I know that she did attend college, as you just said. Was that unusual in those days for a woman to attend college? I think to some extent, yes, but I think maybe, you know, that tide was turning. What so was, yes. What was her life on the prairie like? Because I had read uh, a quote that she said that she always had a fear of dying in a cornfield. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that respect, I sort of relate to her. <laughs> she, well, you know, she didn't really, um, how do I say this? She didn't really like living in Nebraska when they first moved here. In terms of landscape, it's very different from Virginia. You know, Virginia and, and the East Coast, and I'm sure Tara, you know this, you know, there, it's hillier, there's more trees. It's a much different sort of geography than this wide open, unoccupied space that, you know, sometimes the prairie, even though it's not, it looks really, it can look really desolate and just Spartan. And I think that Cather really struggled with that when they first moved here. I'm gonna, I'm paraphrasing, but there's a quote that gets, quoted all the time where Cather talks about being, um, being homesick and nobody paying attention to her and her mother. And she says to the, you know, the country and I had it out together by that next year, you know, I, she basically says that living on the Nebraska prairie was like one of the greatest things about her life, but also the most challenging. Um, so she really had to come to terms with living here and make peace with it. And it wasn't, um, you know, I think sometimes people assume that Cather wants to romanticize living on the prairie and homesteading. And, and I don't think that's necessarily what she's after in her work. It was really hard. And I mean, her family, which probably had a lot more privilege than a lot of families that came here to homestead, you know, they didn't, they didn't keep their their homestead land long enough to, to keep it and to own it. Um, you know, they scrapped it and came into town, so. So when does Willa discover that she wants to be a writer? Do you know how that, how that began with her? Well, I was thinking about that. And I think, I think Willa became a writer because she was a reader. I think reading was really the gateway into her writing career, as it is with so many writers. Um, even at a very young age, Cather had her own sort of personal library, and she would number and label all of her books. We have some, we have some of her books from, we have a lot of what are called association copies in our archives. So they're copies of books that she um, inscribed and gave to friends and family members as gifts or there are books that belong to her family and we have books that belonged to her. And I think her family in general enjoyed reading and enjoy, you know, and enjoyed sort of literary things. Um, but she would, <laughs> she would number her books and then she would write something in the inside of the, the cover, it was something like from the private library of William Cather Jr. or something like that. So we have some of her, Louise, she loved Louisa May Alcott, and so we have some of her books by Louisa May Alcott that have that kind of inscription. One of the most interesting aspects of Cather's life is that she kind of, well, not kind of, she did defy societal norms of the time. Mm -hmm. And for example, at one point in her life, she was wearing her hair very short, mm -hmm. like, a, like a boy. And she, yes. was, she was actually audacious enough to dream of becoming a doctor and even signed her name, William Cather, MD. At, and that was uh, unusual for a, a woman or a girl. Right, so she was a barrier her. breaker. Mm -hmm. And, but yet I, I read that, now I'm not sure if I read that correctly, that she didn't really think of herself as a feminist. I mean, did that word exist then? Did she use a word like that to describe herself? I don't think she would have called herself a feminist. I think that she, I think she would have framed some of those values more in terms of wanting independence. Um, 
So I don't know that, I don't know, you know, she's very much a product of her time in a lot of these, in terms of her values and her, whether she's adhering to values that are, you know, commonplace or not. So I don't know that feminism is really what she would call what she believes in, but I would say that she valued her, uh, her autonomy a great deal. And of course that, you know, ends up becoming a big kind of tenet of feminism as that, as feminism as a school of thought evolves. Um, I did ask our archivist uh, for a little bit of um, background on this question in particular. And so she, you're right, she chopped off all her hair and wore it very short. And she sometimes would wear, um, you know, boys clothes or pants and she would sign her name, William Cather Jr., William Cather MD, her childhood nickname, it seems like, was Willie. So a lot of people called her Willie. So, you know, not feminine um, nicknames or names. But she also, well, to back up, in the 1880s, there was also sort of a, a larger social trend of cutting off your hair if you were a girl. Um, but in some ways, a lot of those haircuts were not so much about maybe wanting to present in a more masculine way, but they were about being rebellious or maybe riling up your parents. And I think in Cather's instance, this probably rings true. Whether or not there were other motivations, you know, I suppose is arguable. We may not really ever know um, what, what that was about fully, but Cather had a very sort of tense relationship at times with her mother, um, like a lot of daughters do. <laughs> I don't know who else can speak to that. I'm the mother of a daughter and I already see that, you know, down the road. But um, I think some of that motivation to, cro to chop off her hair was because she wanted to ruffle her mother's feathers. Um, there's also pictures of Willa with some of her friends who were girls um, such as Evelyn Broadstone and Mary Minor. Um, so Mary Minor would have been portrayed in My Antonia as a member of the Harling family. So the Miners were the prototypes for the Harlings in My Antonia. But all of those girls have short hair. So that to me speaks to maybe something more going on than um, an expression of gender norms or a rebellion against gender norms on Cather's part. So once she graduates college, she goes on to have a couple of jobs. She was a teacher in Pittsburgh. She was also um, a journalist, I believe. Was she a journalist at all? And then yes. she, oh, I'm sorry. And then she worked for S.S. McClure for his magazine as an editor. Mm -hmm. And what prompted her to finally decide to leave her job with McClure's magazine and then go out on her own to be a writer? Well, I think the irony of her sort of her career evolution is that her work at McClure's really is what enabled her to transition out of journalism and into a, a fiction writing, a full-time fiction writing career. Um, so when she started working at McClure's, that opened a lot of doors for her and she was able to form some really important relationships. So Number one, that's how she met Edith Lewis, her partner that she lived with for 39 years. You know, there's, there's a new book about Edith Lewis and Cather's relationship um, by a UNL professor named Melissa Homestead called uh, The Only Wonderful Things. And she really tries to kind of explore the influence that Edith Lewis had on Cather's writing because Edith Lewis had a, ma she very much had a magazine background and a copy, a copy editing and copywriting background. And so, um, you know, she looked at Cather's drafts, she made notes, she would have understood the writing process. And it seems like, you know, at least some of her influence, you know, is pretty literary and maybe um, worth examining even further. So, I think Edith as a presence in her life helped sort of push her to her writing career as we understand it as a novelist. 
And then through her job at McClure's, I think this is how she met Ferris Greenslet, who was an editor at Houghton Mifflin and would become Cather's first important editor. Um, and then later, of course, she went to Knopf um, uh, later in her career when she felt like uh, Houghton Mifflin wasn't maybe, wasn't representing her and marketing her the way she, her books should have been marketed. So, but her relationship with Ferris Greenslet was real, was extremely important in terms of defining her, uh, at least her early career as a novelist. Um, and her job at McClure's is also how she met the writer, Sarah Orne Jewett, who's a regionalist writer. If you're from the East Coast, you, you know, you may know her um, more so than um, people from other parts of the country, but she had an influence on Cather as well. And, you know, she sort of influenced or, or encouraged Cather to focus her energies on her own writing instead of devoting so much energy to kind of editing and helping other people with their writing, which is, you know, what she was doing as an editor at McClure's. So. And thank goodness for that advice, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think those relationships were really, they're really transformational for her and she wouldn't have, she maybe wouldn't have had them if she hadn't been writing for that right. publication. And now I understand that she was also a theater critic and also known as the Meat Axe. Is meat that correct? Axe girl. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. And um, I didn't have a chance to pull a quote from one of her early reviews, but for your viewers who are interested, um, there's a compilation of her, her theater reviews in two books called The World and the Parish, um, which we sell in our bookstore, but they really show <laughs> what kind of critic Cather was. And she was very young when she was doing these theater reviews. So her theater critic days predate, you know, her work at Home Monthly, or they, it overlaps with Home Monthly and it predates McClure's. But she was brutal. Um, <laughs> If she didn't like the the production that she was reviewing, she was very blunt about it. She could be downright cruel about some of the performers um, or some of the actresses that she reviewed. There's, you know, there's some really mean reviews, but she could she could be equally, you know, effusive in her praise as well. So she just had a very strong personality that came out as the theater critic. <laughs> Now, was her first book actually April Twilight's The Book of Poetry, or was it actually um, Alexander's Bridge? Well, let's see. I think, I think it, well, her first novel was Alexander's Bridge, and then April Twilight's was, well, I mean, The Troll Garden, her short story collection, was actually published in McClure's before um, any of those in, I think, 1903. Um, but we always, I mean, we, we call Alexander's Bridge her first, not her first novel and kind of note that as her first big publication. How much of herself did Cather incorporate into her, her novels? Well, I think quite a bit. Um, I was just researching this for a, a event we had at the center, but um, Cather had a close friend who was also a writer named Elizabeth Shepley Surgent. And Surgent wrote a book about Willa Cather later on after Cather had died. And she said, and oh, let's see. I think she quoted Cather as saying um, that her career really started when she stopped admiring and started remembering you know, meaning that she really, when she really turned to her memories and her life in Nebraska and her, you know, what she had read and her kind of her own intellectual life, that's when her writing career really sort of came alive. So I think that there's a great deal of her own life and people she really knew um, that permeate her work. Now, Willa Cather, um as far as I have read, said that she really didn't enjoy women writers with the exception of a few. Mm -hmm. And she, she called them sentimental, too sentimental. Now, do you feel that Cather objected to the way the writers were portraying women? 
in novels? Is that what bothered her about women writers? I don't know about that. I no, I, I did a little more research for this question as well. And I think that, well, let's see. How do I want to put this? I don't think that she objected to women writers per se, but I think she knew she knew what she liked and she knew why she liked it or why she didn't like what she didn't like. Um, she really did have a lot of friends that were women writers. And I think she probably read a great deal of women writers too. Um, I mentioned Elizabeth Shepley Surgeon. She was friends with Sarah Orne Jewett. Um, I mentioned that she loved Louisa May Alcott as a child. Um, she also had a very good friend named Zoe Akins, who ended up being a playwright and a screenwriter. And she actually won a Pulitzer for adapting an Edith Wharton novel into a play. Um, Fanny Butcher was another uh, friend of hers. Um, Dorothy Canfield Fisher, also another writer friend. So I think that maybe it's not so much about women writers, but um, she was very particular just about, you know, what style she liked and she could articulate what she did and didn't like, you know, maybe more clearly than other, other writers or other people or other readers could. Um, you know, she respected writers, I think, even if she didn't enjoy their work um, as much as other women writers. So there's a quote from a letter to Ferris Greenslet, where she says, have you seen the article Nordica in fiction in the musical Courier? Why am I said to write like Mrs. Wharton? It is an honor that I dream not of. So I think that quote really illustrates the fact that she could really respect and appreciate or understand, you know, a writer, that a woman writer was good or skilled, even if it wasn't her cup of tea. Right. Now, in, in some of her books, especially My Antonia, I noticed that she made the protagonist or one of the, the protagonists, the narrator, Jim, mm -hmm. he's portrayed as the slightly weaker gender in Antonia, whereas Antonia displays strength and fortitude. Was it deliberate on Cather's part to ignore gender stereotypical roles of men and women? Because she seemed to make the women a lot stronger in her novels. Oh yeah, I think she can subvert, she could subvert those roles and maybe enjoy doing so. I mean, you see that in O Pioneers with Alexandra, you know, she kind of, she's the person that stopped, or I'm sorry, that, that made her father's farm a success rather than her brother's. Um, and then you see, you know, uh, Taya Kronberg in The Song of the Lark, you know, she's very strong and pursues her career very sort of aggressively. And, um, you know, that may not have been the nor the typical way you would portray a woman. Um, I think that with Ant my Antonia, she was really, she really wanted to convey Anna Pavelka's actual personality and spirit. And I think there's a lot of truth in how Antonia is portrayed based on the real person, Anna. And I think as far as her choice to make the protagonist or Jim a man, um, there's an interview with Eleanor Hinman in 1921 where she talks about that choice. She talks about how she realized that in writing about Anna Pavelka as Antonia, that when she knew Anna, when she lived in Red Cloud, a lot of the people that talked about Anna were men and that she had friendships with men that seemed meaningful, you know, on a, in, a, in a purely platonic way. But she said in that interview, I noticed that much of what I knew about Annie Pavelka uh, came from the talks I had with young men. She had a fascination for them and they used to be with her whenever they could. They had to manage it on the sly because she was only a hired girl, but they respected and admired her and she meant a good deal to some of them. So I decided to make my observer a young man. That's amazing. You know, it's, it's ironic that she wasn't too happy about living on the prairie, but yet she does have these memories and she gave voice to all the immigrant mm -hmm. families that she had come across. Mm -hmm. 
So one of the things I also noticed for now looking back in my high school days, Willa Cather, I have never, I was never taught any of her stories. We were always taught to read To Kill a Mockingbird, The Scarlet Letter, all of those books. Mm -hmm. Is it true that she objected to her work being taught in school? I don't know that she objected to it, but I think that she thought that readers would get more out of her books if they read them as adults. Um, I don't know that I agree with her about that. And I don't know, readers have changed and adolescence has changed. And I don't know if that's necessarily true, but I think she sort of just thought that her books wouldn't appeal to teenagers. Right. And I guess I could see why, because, you know, with the prairie and all of that, but The mm -hmm. Professor's House is a wonderful book. I think that yeah. would be a good one for the schools to teach. Well, I think A Lost Lady and Lucy Gaynor oh, yeah. are great books for high schoolers. They're not, you know, she does sometimes her prose and her sort of her observations about sort of the interiority of her characters. I can see how that might, you know, I mean, I really like books like that. Yeah. I can see how a younger reader might not connect with those kinds of descriptions or that kind of prose. But I think with The Lost Lady and Lucy Gayhart, you know, those are shorter books. There's dramatic things that happen. Um, you know, there's characters in each of those books that you just, that, well, I just despise. And there's characters I feel a lot of sympathy for. And so I think they inspire sort of an emotional response that maybe an adolescent reader would you know get into. So in 1934 there was a film adaptation of her book A Lost Lady which I believe Barbara Stanwyck was in mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. That's right. Once Cather saw that if she, she did not she was adamant that no more movies be made of her books. Now what was it about the movies that she didn't like? Well that one in particular and of course this sort of stipulation in her will has expired so you know people I think can make movies more freely from her work than they could in the past that movie just really didn't retain anything of the original story and um you know it's just regarded as poorly made poorly executed even though I mean Barbara Stanwyck was a huge movie star at that time um and she was actually, well, a little bit of Nebraska movie trivia. Barbara Stanwyck was married to uh, Robert Taylor, who was an actor in like, like the 30s and 40s. And he is from Beatrice, Nebraska. So, um, and they were also sort of on the wrong side of the blacklist in Hollywood. <laughs> so I don't know, there's an interesting side history there, but it just wasn't a well-made movie. And Cather already, I think, had a bias against, she, she, she seemed to sort of pit theater against moving pictures, which makes sense. And she was of the opinion that um, theater brought more to a community and there was just something more uh, artistic or valuable in the experience of going to a theater production than there was from going to a movie. So she, you know, she grew up where Red Cloud has an opera house that was in operation until 1919. And now we run it uh, through our foundation and we have monthly performances. Um, but she grew up at a time where a theater troupe would come. They'd spend the whole week in your town. You kind of get to know the actors. And then they'd put on this production that everybody had anticipated all week. And it was an exciting thing. And so her experience of theater going wasn't just about the, you know, the end production when the lights go down and the curtain goes up. It was really about the experience of having performers and artists in your community to bring that to the community. And so she didn't see how that translated from films. And she saw films, you know, you go in this dark theater, you leave your community and you're removed from it. And then you come back out. And I think that that sort of perception of film you know, really influenced her, her opinion of films in general. So tell me a little about your impression of Willa Cather as a person. What do you think her personality was like based on everything that you know about her? 
Oh my gosh. I think that she probably had a very wicked biting sense of humor. She would be a great guest at a dinner party. Um, I think she was very, I know the word sophisticated comes with a lot of connotation that, that isn't always positive, but I think she was very sophisticated and cosmopolitan. And I think a lot of times contemporary readers have preconceived ideas about her that are not correct. You know, she gets pinned as a regionalist writer and she's so, she's so connected to sort of representations of rural life in literature that I don't know that people really understand that she wasn't a rural person for most of her life. For most of her life, she was a New Yorker. And I think she was really smart, really interesting. And I think even though in photographs, she looks really serious and sometimes even dowdy, she was probably a lot of fun. Now, does she have any descendants still living? She does. Um, not really in Nebraska, but uh, in Virginia, she has, there's, there's Cather relatives in Virginia and there, I know there's a couple, I think in New Mexico, but you know, the, the list, the kind of the group of Cather descendants is, you know, it's getting smaller. And I know that she was an extremely private person. So how would she feel about you and I talking about her today? I mean, would she, would she be surprised that her books are still being read and she's still being talked about? I think she'd be really happy that her books were still being read. And I think she would really enjoy that people were talking about her books and reading them. I don't know. I don't know that she, I know in her lifetime, she really wanted to keep details about her life, you know, private and unknown to, to people. I don't know how that would change, you know, in light of all the other sort of changes that have happened um, post-World War II, you know, late 20th century, sort of different, um, different ways that we study and read literature. That's all part of it. Uh, some of the social movements that have happened in the last, you know, 75 years. I don't know if she would really be as upset as maybe she would be if we were just thinking about like 19, early 20th century Cather. She would might you understand the utility of, of, knowing about the writer. Right, but she didn't like her private life discussed, is that right? Mm -hmm. So would she be yeah. kind of um, a little put off by the fact that people are, they wanna know about her private life to the point where they wanna know why she wasn't married, was mm -hmm. she gay, was she bisexual? This is a part of her life that she would never want discussed. Mm -hmm. She felt like the work belonged to the people and her private life belonged to her, correct? I think for the most part, yes. I would say, wouldn't anybody be yeah. uncomfortable <laughs> with some of those details being picked apart or looked at or, um, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's a part of being a public person that's really uncomfortable. And I don't blame Cather for trying to control um, that part of her life and her career. So yeah, I would say she probably wouldn't like a lot about it, but I also think she might understand, you know, where those discussions sit in terms of keeping somebody's literary legacy alive. That I think she would enjoy. And is it true she often lied about when she was born? Because mm -hmm. I've heard two different dates, 70, 1873, 1876. She did lie about her, her age. Um, I don't know why, other than, you know, wanting to seem younger, but her headstone in, in New Hampshire, the year of her birth is listed as 1876, but it was 1873. So it's wrong on her headstone. How did she deal with the fame that writing brought her? Was she comfortable? Did she, first of all, did she go out and do readings like other writers and lectures? Oh, I mean, she gave a lot of interviews. I don't know that doing public readings, I don't know that that was really, I don't know if that worked the same way it does now, but she definitely gave interviews for newspapers. She wrote a lot of letters. Um, I think her correspondence with different people, different literary figures, different editors, her family, um, 
you know, is pretty illuminating in terms of how she wanted to be perceived by people or, you know, what kinds of relationships she wanted to nurture. But yeah, I think she was aware of having a public persona and wanted to reach a readership through her interviews and, and things like that. And you mentioned before that she spent the majority of her life in New York. Do you know what brought her there? Well, oh gosh. Now she stopped working at McClure's in 1906, I believe, or no, 1912. She had already gone to, she'd already been to New York. So I think it was McClure's. I think she moved to New York in 1906. And then she was, she also loved New Hampshire. Is that correct? Because I know that's where she's buried, right? She is buried, <clears throat> excuse me, in Jaffrey, New Hampshire. I need to take a drink of water. She used to like to go and write at a place called the Shattuck Inn. And she knew the innkeepers. I have a postcard of the Shattuck Inn uh, on my bulletin board. <clears throat> but she, the, the inn is no longer there. But yeah, she developed a relationship with the innkeepers. She would go there to write. Sometimes she would, you know, there's kind of a famous story about her uh, taking a tent and writing in a tent to finish my Antonia. So that was a place where she really found a lot of inspiration and, and the, the right kind of headspace to be creative in. Let's, let's bring Cather into the 21st century. What do you think about, what would she think about our current culture and how do you think she would fit into today's narrative? Do you think um, she'd be happy about the way society is today? Politics um, and all that. Was she a political no. person? I, you know, not really. I know every time the anniversary of sort of women's suffrage comes around, people want to know what she thought about women getting the right to vote. And there's really not much, there's not much that she said in any kind of documented way. So we just really don't know. I don't think that she expressed her politics in, a, in it all the time because she wanted to, again, I think that was part of keeping her personal life, you know, protected. I don't know. I think she would really, I think she would really struggle with things like social media. Um, I'm just imagining her being sort of a 21st century best-selling author and having an agent that would want her to have an Instagram account. <laughs> Maybe she'd hire one of her nieces or nephews or somebody to run that for her. But, um, I think that there's a really sort of, at times it seems like there's a lot of anti-intellectualism sort of floating around in our public and popular culture. And I think that would really be sad to her that, you know, learning about things and, and talking to experts and valuing sort of deep thought. I think that the sort of attitudes about those things would really depress her <laughs> today. Why do you think she's still relevant all these years Why? later? Oh, gosh. Well, I think she's relevant for the reasons that, you know, a lot of writers remain relevant. I think because you can read a lot of her books and get something different out of it every time you read it. I think you can, you can read the same thing that somebody else reads by Willa Cather and then have this really fun sort of debate about what it means. So I think there's like an elasticity to her writing that's really valuable and keeps her relevant. Um, I think she captured a certain moment in history that not a lot of people, you know, at least in, in our sort of popular imagination wrote about, or at least not a lot of notable people, especially women. So I think she's relevant for that reason. I think, as you mentioned earlier, she captures sort of the immigrant experience um, during the home, the kind of early homesteading years after 1862. Um, I think her writing is just really beautiful um, and complex and, you know, even for that alone, just different turns of phrase and her sort of character observations and all of those things you know, if you do them well, 
they don't really go out, fall out of fashion, or if they do, you can still sort of find something valuable to talk about in reference to them. So, yeah. Can you tell us a little about the Willa Cather Center, what people can expect when they come there to visit? Oh, I would love to. Um, well, we're a very unique place. Um, sometimes we struggle to explain what all you can do here because we're not like other historic house museums. Um, so we have the largest collection of properties and artifacts devoted to any American writer, uh, which means we have lots of buildings you can go into, not just Willa Cather's um, childhood home, but you can visit the Willa Cather childhood home. We do guided tours of historic sites. We also offer uh, guided tours of a prairie preserve that we maintain and that we own that's five miles south of town. So you can sort of see the landscape that Cather is writing about. It's a totally unplowed prairie with native plants and grasses. Um, we offer a very long and fun dirt road country tour that you can take with a guide if you really want to get into like some of the deep cuts with Willa Cather. Our center opened in 2017. It's an expanded center that includes a permanent Willa Cather exhibit uh, and a larger bookstore. We also have an art gallery and we have exhibits there that we have about six exhibits a year. And all of that is free to, to visit. So there's no charge to go into our Cather exhibit, our art gallery or anything like that. Um, we also operate a performance space uh, at the Red Cloud Opera House. So we program different plays, musical acts, things like that every year. Um, so there's just a, a lot to do um, and experience. I think we really want to provide a holistic experience for visitors, whether they're visiting in person or even online. We really want you to understand not just who Willa Cather was, but the place that she wrote about so often and why she wrote about it. And that we also wanna, you know, extend some of her values, you know, out to what we do with the community as well. And what are the days and times that you're open? We are open Tuesday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And you can contact me, Rachel Olson, to schedule a tour or you can call us. Uh, during the winter from November 1st to February 28th, our, our, our Saturday hours are shortened to 10 to 2, but from now until October 31st, we're open Tuesday through Saturday, 9 to 5. And you mentioned you could take a tour through her house. Is, are the furnishings authentic or is it really her stuff? Some of it is. So right now we're in the middle of a years-long multi-property restoration project. And the childhood home is actually the next property to uh, that will be restored. So some of uh, some of the uh, artifacts that belong to the Cather family have been taken out and are being stored in our archival facility. But there are still things in the house that belong to the Cathers, and there are things that are of the period, so they're meant to approximate what was there when Willa Cather lived there as a child. Um, we have. Willa Cather, you know, the highlight of the childhood home tour is Willa Cather's bedroom, which still um, has the original wallpaper that Willa hung herself as a girl in the bedroom. So. Wow. So it's definitely is worth the trip to Nebraska. Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's my dream to get out there. I have not gotten out there yet, but I will eventually. You should. You should. Um, it's a really fun, you know, spending a weekend in Red Cloud, if you're a Willa Cather fan, I think is a really fun experience. We have staff who are really committed to their work, myself included, and who really love having visitors and are really excited to talk about Willa Cather's writing and her life with anyone who comes to the door. Well, that's awesome. And thank you so much, Rachel, for being on today and giving oh, a pleasure. talk about Willa, your perspective, and all these wonderful facts that I'm yes. learning. I've read a lot about her, but I learned so much through you. So I want to yeah. thank you for being here today. She's very, you know, I hate to break it to her, but she's so interesting to read about. It makes honoring her wishes yeah. <laughs> to stay private really difficult. <laughs> I know, and I, and I have the book of her letters too, which I know, you know, sometimes I feel guilty that I even have it, but 
we want to know. We want to get closer to her as much as we can, I think. Yeah, she's a really interesting person. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I look forward to meeting you in person someday. Likewise. So that concludes another episode of Tea with Tara. I want to thank Rachel Olson for being on today and the wonderful discussion about my favorite writer, Willa Cather. So if you guys are anywhere near Nebraska, or even if you're not, take a trip to Nebraska. It is well worth it. I'm going to get there someday, I promise. So until next time, writers, happy writing, keep writing. See you next time.